who was that guy anyway? But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, thank, it's great to be back at their school, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for this opportunity. Um, and when I was thinking about what I was going to say, uh, the, uh, the thing that came to mind was, uh, fortunately, I, I read Steve Jobs', Jobs uh, graduation speech from Stanford in 2005, back you know, several weeks before he died. But you know wh what, he, what he said there was, looking back on his career, uh, that you could follow the dots backwards but not forwards, and that going forwards, you had to have a vision and a passion. And <clears throat> that sort of got me thinking about what I've been doing for the past umpteen years. And, uh, and it's been about following passions. But what I'm going to talk about today is uh, sort of the history of, of solar, my involvement in it, uh, the unconventional thinking uh, that may have, may have helped me along the way, uh, borrowing ideas, stealing ideas, applying them to new things, doing new things. <sighs> Uh, and sort of all of the things that, that their school got me started with uh, years ago uh, with their engineering programs. Um, whoops, let's see. Hey, whoops, no, that went twice. Here we go. So first of all, I, you know, a lot of people ask me what my undergraduate degree is, and I say I have a Bachelor of Arts in Engineering. And they kind of look kind of like, what? Uh, you know, what, what kind of engineering is Bachelor of Arts Engineering. And uh, so I, I sort of came to thinking about uh, sort of three different kinds of engineering, the, the Thayer School style, uh, MIT style, and, uh, and what I call code book engineering style. Uh, sort of Thayer School is invent, MIT was study, and then maybe invent. And uh, the code book style is sort of keep the trains running, don't change anything, don't tip the apple cart, uh, everything's working, don't break it. You know, or you'll have to fix it. So, I guess I'd admit, in addition to that first line, a little bit of a disdain for politics. Although I've learned in the, over the years that uh, politics is important, uh, and uh, appreciate those who who take the engineering designs that, that people come up with and actually <coughs> refine them and 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 make them co code compliant, uh, make them. Uh, transportable and, and usable by others. Um, one thing I've always thought is that uh, uh, getting things to 80% of perfect uh, takes about 20% of the time, and that's, that's the fun part. The last 20%, fine tuning, marketing, sales, production, you know, that's boring. So most of my career, I've, I've kind of gone 80% and then quit and gone somewhere else. Um, and then the last line, well, a couple last lines here, but one, um, uh, the policy for on and off grid, I'll, I'll get into that later. But one, one thing that was really sort of eye-opening to me years, so maybe 15, 18 years ago, uh, was a trip to India and, and discovering how uh, disparate the distribution of wealth is in, in certain places. And then coming back here and then thinking in the 1990s how the United States is becoming India and India the United States. I mean, there's this globalization going on that sort of uh, the distribution of wealth is getting more and more concentrated uh, for the rich and the poor. And I think there was a, a study that the, Cong the Congressional Budget Office just put out uh, earlier this week you know, talking about it in the United States, but you know, that, that's something that's kind of on my mind because when you're in the photovoltaics business or the solar business, you you know that uh, you know there's like almost eight billion people on Earth, but how many of those have ever used electricity? How many have ever used a telephone? And the number, if you go and check it out, is kind of staggering. And so. Um, in the back of my mind, I, I think about this a lot. OK, so now on to the dull stuff. Um, what sort of has driven the development of solar power? Uh, you know, are, are, these, are these three things? Uh, you know, one thing I think about looking at ener energy environment and the economy is that <coughs> uh, you know, 
I guess our Constitution or our Declaration says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think of externalities. What we need is with warmth and heat. Uh, we need food. We need water. And years and years ago, uh, around Hanover, I'm sure, if you wanted to stay warm, you just went and cut down a tree and burned it. You, you can't do that anymore. You know, it's, you know, it, you got to pay for it somehow. And then when I was a student here at Dartmouth, uh, or soon before I was a student at Dartmouth, uh, when you wanted water, you know, you took it from a reservoir on, on East Wheelock Street, and when you were done with it, you probably put it in the Connecticut River. And you didn't worry about, you know, White River Junction. But water isn't free anymore. Uh, you can't just use it and throw it out and pollute it. Um, and, and we're sort of at the point now where air is free, right? Uh, you can use it, you know, CO2, any emissions, whatever. But, you know, I think we're at the cusp of where that's about to change. Uh, and so, you know, when I look at these drivers, I think, you know, like what, you know, what's common sense? Uh, what makes sense for the long term? Does our accounting systems really take into account everything that should be taken into account uh, when business decisions are being made? So I'm going to use this, this graphic. I don't really care about what all those words are, but the important thing is the, the green line and uh, the timeline, which is the, the important one here is the price of oil. Okay? So this, this is the career that started before oil was expensive. I, uh, you know, I think when I was a student, gasoline was 18 cents a gallon. Uh, oil was $4 a barrel. Uh, I guess it's a little bit higher. Now it was twenty dollars a barrel, whatever. Um, but but basically, a lot has happened. So the first green line is after I left their school, I went to MIT and I studied ocean engineering. Uh, we were in Vietnam. There was a draft. Uh, there was. I see people trying to read all these words. Don't do it. It's you. Um, it's not important. It's just that one line. But uh, to, to put things in perspective. So anyway. First part of the career, uh, studying at MIT, and uh, take some time to read, if you can, this, this eye test. Because Jer Jerry Milgram, as I, as I speak, Jerry Milgram was my thesis advisor and mentor at MIT. Uh, he was also a sailor, as was I. And uh, when I, I read that thing from Steve Jobs, he talked about following the dots backward to see you know, what happened and, and how your career got, got moved. And, and Jerry was kind of this guy that liked to upset apple carts. Um, he had this, this uh, boat. We actually built it, parts of it in the, uh, in the basement at MIT in the wood shops and stuff. And I helped him with a number, number of pieces. And my wife and I sailed with him on it a number of times. But he built this boat that, that sort of shook the establishment and did, did it differently, and, and the establishment really didn't like him. You know, they, they wrote up in Sports Illustrated that it was the ugliest boat ever and that uh, you, know, you could imagine this wispy-haired guy um, doing things differently and, and, and annoying people. Well, <clears throat> people took notice of his intelligence. And after a while, instead of that kind of boat, he was designing the America's Cube boats. Uh, for the uh, America's Cup races for Bill Koch. And um, after that, I think Bill Koch probably <coughs> bought him a, 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 a true yachting blazer uh, as he, he won the America's Cup. And uh, so here's a guy who sort of, in my formative years at your age, sort of taught me a little bit about doing things differently. Uh, seeing opportunities, uh, taking, taking advantage of them. Uh, I didn't follow him into the, into the art design business. That was, um, I don't know, that, 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 that he called it a, uh, what was his word? He had a word for it. It was a uh, remunerative hobby. He said, yachting is my remunerative hobby when they had a big exhibit of his work at MIT, gave a talk. And uh, you know, to some extent, I, I worry that my work in solar energy has been a remunerative hobby as well. Uh, but while I was studying, the, the, my introduction to the energy business and the pollution business uh, was 
uh, developing oil barriers uh, that could be used for picking up oil spills uh, on the open ocean. Um, you know, I did, you know, this was my master's work. It was kind of practical. My, my graduate, my uh, doctoral work was a bunch of integral equations that nobody could solve, and it turned out I couldn't either. Um, and then, and then uh, computational fluid mechanics came along, you know, five years afterwards and took care of it, everything I was worrying about. So it sort of became irrelevant. But a lot of math and a lot of physics in my background <coughs> from, from Dartmouth and Thayer School and MIT. Um, the other thing that, that we got involved with was uh, oil spills, obviously. And uh, one of the fun things I had uh, an opportunity to, to do uh, just before I started my work in, in solar was to be on board this ship uh, off Nantucket for about a day after it ran aground and spilled all of its uh, oil, uh, number six oil, uh, which is sort of, it's after you make gasoline and after you make jet fuel and just before you make asphalt. It's, it's right there in the middle, you know? and. Uh, yeah, it was pretty ugly stuff, and, and this ship was pretty ugly, and, but it was a lot of fun. You got to go out in the ocean in December and fly around with the Coast Guard in helicopters, and, and uh, you know, all this oil was lost, but it went off into the Gulf Stream, uh, so you know, it didn't come onto a shore. People, I think, were looking for you know, ducks and, and seagulls and you know, anything with oil on them on Nantucket, but it, it didn't. It was only 50 miles away. But it, it, went the other way, so, so people forgot about it. But anyway, Dartmouth burns this oil, same stuff, number six, uh, to run the lights here, to keep you warm, all this kind of good stuff I think we just talked about. So um, um, you know, go down and ask for a sample of what number six looks like. It's, it's kind of the consistency of jello, um, fun stuff. But anyway, two weeks after this, I started my career in solar. And so we moved to the next step, you know, sort of the, the post-fluid uh, mechanics, post-ocean engineering. Actually, I, I had a choice of starting work in solar energy or uh, staying in, in marine work and going to Houston, where Shell Oil wanted me to figure out how to drill for oil uh, north of Prudhoe Bay. And the, the design challenge was ice 10 meters thick is moving past you at you know, like three meters a day. And, and you're going to drill for oil through this. You know? and it, 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 I don't know. Somehow it seemed a lot more fun to stay in Massachusetts and to uh, shift into solar energy. And since most of my background from Thayer and MIT was mathematics, you know, applied math, physics, you, know, you just change the name of the variables and move into a different field. Um, so what was making the world go around then? Um, the first movers uh, in solar were probably the United States in the 70s um, for these reasons, uh, then Japan, uh, and then Germany. Uh, nothing like a nuclear power accident to motivate change in the political sense. Um, my work was with, a, with a, a group of folks who had basically learned how to use photovoltaics, making satellites and communication satellites. So they knew about all the things you had to know about PV to make them work. And I sort of provided the, the common sense engineering and, and roll up my sleeves and build it perspective on it. Um, and the, that's an ugly slide, isn't it? Is that, is that what housing really looks like? It, it's not. I, I, I found that for a magazine cover. But you know, when, when you're young and 30 and, and, and starting your career and you want to do solar, you want to put it sort of where you understand. You want to put it on your roof. And uh, you know, what better example of roofs than just cookie cutter roofs and cookie cutter solar and stuff? Um, I was at a meeting in Washington. Uh, and with, with groups from MIT and Caltech and, and the Department of Energy was saying, you know, in this large meeting, now we ought to have a plan for how to put PV on rooftops. And I said, you know, first to put up your hand. I said, okay, you do it. So 
that's how it happened, you know? It's sort of, Woody Allen said something like 90% of life is showing up. Well, you know, be there at the right time. It's a little career advice, you know? Be thinking about what the opportunities are, and when you see it, raise your hand. Say, hey, I'll write that plan. So, excuse me. So, I got to write DOE's plan for how to put PV on rooftops, and our sponsorship at that point came just from the government. And in, in a nutshell, what, what I did was set up a facility in, at MIT and one in southern New Mexico where we played, basically played with PV on rooftops. We tried, you know, all sorts of different, different things about, you know, how you mount them, how you wire them. There's a lot of detail in that that, you know, it's just, you just don't go throw it up and go away. You have to figure out the right voltage, the right dimensions, the right connectors, you know. And, and you know, and, and this is all to make electricity that's 10 times more expensive than what you can buy from the, the grid, which is, you know, a little bit of a hard sell, but that's why the government's the sponsor. Um, so that, that took quite a while, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stay with it, but you know, basically we, we were able in, in the lab, so to speak, to come up with good ideas on, on how, to, um, how to do solar on rooftops. And you know, the, the next challenge is, okay, putting solar on a rooftop is great, now, you always have an opportunity with, with solar to either store the energy in a battery or feed it back onto the grid. You know, and uh, remote off-power PV systems are a very, very good idea for remote areas. Uh, but for lots and lots and lots of PV to happen uh, in, in developed places, you know, I think much better to put it on the grid and get rid of the batteries, which are were then and are still now expensive. You know, if, if someone can invent a 100% efficient battery from input to output uh, at no cost, uh, you'll become a millionaire, and that would be a good thing. Uh, but what we needed to do after we showed that we could put these things on rooftops was to, to prove that to the electric utilities in the United States that it was okay to, um, you know, to interconnect these things and let the power run backwards and forwards uh, between a PV system, the load in a, in a house or whatever, and, and the grid. And this was pretty revolutionary stuff back then. You know, they, the utility said, oh, we've never done that. We're not designed to do that. You know, the, the, the grid is designed for central generation and dispersing the power outward. And uh, we're not sure we can do that. You know? We do that. And so I, I said, well, what we really need to do is find a neighborhood someplace where we can put PV on, you know, a bunch of houses and, and you know, say, hey, hey, look, utility, the power's going backwards and everything's okay. You know, it's like kicking the tires. And um, so, you know, that's kind of a hard sell when, when Mr. Reagan is president and shutting down the, uh, the solar programs all across the United States. Uh, if you remember that, that oil slide, you know, oil has dropped from whatever it was, the crisis is over, uh, nothing's going on, you know, everything is fine, you know, why do you want to do this? And um, so that's where, you know, ag again, um, you know, keep your eyes open, look for opportunities, know what you want to do when you see the opportunity and raise your hand. Um, this, this is a, a, a picture of the Super Phoenix uh, breeder reactor in France. The French are very advanced in nuclear power, and they made a reactor that could actually uh, take spent fuel and make it into energy. Uh, the United States was going to build, with the Tennessee Valley Authority in the early 1980s, they were going to build a, uh, uh, a breeder reactor, uh, but it got canceled. The project got canceled. and. Um, so the next, the next step in, in establishing the Gardner Project was that um, uh, we had a governor, Mike Dukakis, you know, who ran for president in 1988 against George Bush Sr., uh, made the mistake of being photographed in a tank, and uh, that probably, that along with one other thing, probably killed his presidency, his aspirations. But he, he was an absolute photovoltaic nut. I mean, he just couldn't get enough of this stuff. 
and so we met with him all the time and, and uh, you know had you know he was just really enthusiastic it was really great I wish he hadn't done that picture um, and then this other person who's in the third picture he's got a red jacket on standing next to Susan Hockfield who's the, the head of MIT now uh, he happened to be the research director at New England Electric System electric power in um, 1984 and Ed, Ed um, uh, came to visit my office for some entirely different work we were doing he said hey are those solar panels out there I said, yeah. And he said, I have a problem. He said, New England Electric, my company, had a million dollars in their research budgets dedicated to Clinch River. And they just canceled it. Okay, that's number one. So there's a million dollars, you know, sitting there, burning a hole. Uh, number two was that the chairman of New England Power at the time was a woman named Joan Bach, who uh, happened to be at a cocktail party with Governor Dukakis. And Joan Bach said to Governor Dukakis, or, you know, or Dukakis said to Bach, well, what are you guys doing at photovoltaics? And she said, hmm, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so Joan Bach asked Ed Gulachensky, gave, gave him a problem, like, what should we do in photovoltaics? And oh, by the way, we have a million dollars. And then two days later, Ed Gulachensky visited my lab. Okay. Now, the last piece that made it happen, you guys are all PC people or Apple people, and you, know, you always had this stuff. And you didn't have to write things out by hand. And I, well, I, I had just acquired a PC, and, you know, like word processor, and I had a weekend. And so over a weekend, I wrote sort of a four-page white paper about why New England Electric should build a whole group of PV houses connected to the grid to demonstrate you know, how, how this works. So anyway, um, a year later, the first four of these houses had PV systems on their roofs. And we picked a neighborhood in Gardner, Massachusetts, which was out at the end of nowhere. You know, there was beyond, beyond this neighborhood, there was nothing. It was at the end of the line. And so if we put PV on all these rooftops, you know, somewhere you know, down here, because the, the, the substation was that way. Uh, some, somewhere down here, the power in the middle of the day would be going backwards. You know, that's never happened on a grid before. Will it work? Hmm, don't know. So anyway, we, we, we you know, th this was utilities sort of kicking the tires. It's kind of like, can we buy this stuff? Let's try it out. So anyway, um, Gardner evolved. We built 30 houses. Uh, Google Earth is wonderful. You can do time lapse over years. And you can see the enemy of photovoltaics that's like encroaching on these houses, these trees. If you go back again, you know, watch again. See those trees, they're just marching, marching. They're gonna shade those panels eventually. So anyway, most, most of these are still working. And, and so the question is, which is better, trees or PV for the environment? And I'm not sure on that one. You know, trees absorb CO2 and PV displaces coal plants. But I mean, you gotta do the math to figure out whether it really works. So, okay, next, next thing that comes along, um, we got the Gardner project built with that million dollars from the Clinch River Breeder Reactor Project. Um, we had planned to, to monitor it and to put instruments on it to make sure that, that everything would work fine. And the people that were gonna sponsor that, the Electric Power Research Institute in California said, well, we had a budget problem. Um, sorry, but we have to wait a year to start this. Well, I don't know if Thayer School does this, but MIT doesn't look favorably to paying me for a year to sit on my hands waiting for the research money to come in next year. So the group was disbanded. We shut down the projects. It was a pretty bad time. Uh, but a another lesson for careers, you know, when things look terrible, you know, look the other way or look to the side, and, you know, there's probably a solution out there. And Sure enough, a year later, New England Electric came back to me and said, well, hey, Ed, where are you now? We need to do this. And I said, hmm, start a company. So that's, uh, that, that's how you move from academia to doing things in the real world. You know, your research funding runs out and you have to do something real. 
Um, so anyway, um, the next phase. Um, first of all, again, opportunities, you know, not necessarily jobs. You know, you, you know, people want to hire you to do something, but you know, if you have any ideas, you should do it yourself. A little suggestion. Um, so we started a company, and uh, uh, now we had sponsorship from electric utilities, you know, not just the government. And uh, this is good. Uh, we also had to survive. You know, you start a company with one project, and, and uh, that's a good thing. But you know, what's the next thing? And uh, so the good thing is, you know, we, we got introduced to R and D departments from utilities all over the country because of this this project of interconnecting distributed generation. And another company, Florida Power and Light, I guess it was, came to us and said, "Hey, you know, we we saw the instrumentation you're using. Well, we'd like to use that on a substation." And um, so that was, you know, that 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 was more bread on the table, so to speak. Um, and then the and then the uh, uh, electric utility or electric power research institute said, you know, hey, this PV is good stuff, but it's not cost effective. You know, it doesn't make any sense to connect it to the grid. What you should really be doing with this is remote power and, and uh, powering things that, you know, where, where the grid doesn't make any sense. And so why don't you do some stuff for us in this area and, and come around and teach utilities? So we, we got hired. Well, I mean, talk, talk about a marketing opportunity. We got hired as a company to travel to like two dozen utilities all around the United States, telling them about photovoltaics for the first time, meeting their R&D people, um, you know, talking like I'm talking today, ex explaining the technology, um, and uh, you know, encouraging them to to start small, you know, and do projects. So we, <coughs> in retrospect, again looking back, perfect opportunity. And here, here's some of the things that we did. Um, the one on the left is a is a switch, a remotely controlled switch on a hydroelectric uh, penstock dam in central Massachusetts. It's two miles. It, it's it's where the water comes from to go into the hydro plant. It's two miles from the nearest power line, and they need to have a button somewhere they can push to close that gate. If you know if the pipe breaks, you know instead of sending a guy up in the truck tomorrow. Because you know, if you come up tomorrow, all the water's gone out of the out of the reservoir. So how do you power that thing? Duh. You know, they they've been putting a new battery up there every two weeks with the guy in the truck, and they say, oh, put some solar panels up. Um, another one is lighting. Um, this is uh, a standard utility pole. Uh, they wanted a light in a remote parking lot in I think it was in Amherst, Massachusetts. Sure, put some PV on the top and some batteries, and away we go. Um, this one, I, I, I tried to see it driving up last night, but I couldn't quite make it out. But if you, if you go by exit six in Manchester, there's a fish ladder uh, right up alongside the, uh, the hydro station there. And you know, years ago, this was sitting there making light you know, for the visitors to look at the fish ladder. Um, and and the, again, the, the one of the the most fun ones, and I think this has been replicated a number of times, is this one on the right. This is um, uh, about 100 miles down the Connecticut River, at least it was, it's probably still there. But it's about 100 miles down the Connecticut River on an island in the, in the river that's owned by uh, Northeast Utilities. And up here is one of the few uh, eagle nesting uh, eagle nests uh, you know, in New England. Back, this was, I don't know, 15 years ago. Uh, this rare, you know, to have eagles, but they're trying to bring them back, you know, and, and get them to grow again and the like. So, you know, what what better way for the utility to get um, very good media is to like, you know, show people the eagle. And uh, so we we worked with a local television station and some radio magic, and and built this little uh, uh, camera that was up above the eagle's nest, shining down into it. You know, watching the eagle have chicks. You know, and there are a lot of these 
uh, webcams now that are around that do this. But this was one of the first. We actually had the, the Secretary of the Interior uh, come out to this site to declare that the, the eagle was no longer endangered when that happened. That was, I don't know, sometime. <laughs> so, you know, just look what a little tiny, look what like 150 watts of PV can do for the public relations of, uh, of a utility. But, you know, they got to learn how it worked, which is great. So they've gone on to do other good things. They're doing megawatts now. Um, so early applications, uh, again, introduced us to utilities, uh, got to know their folks, got to know what made them tick. And then along comes this other place. How, how many people here, raise your hand if you've ever seen this place. Oh, that's terrible. Come on, more, more, more. Oh, everyone look in shame. Oh, jeez. Okay. This is, this is the uh, Musalak Ravine Lodge, for those of you who, who failed the test. And um, it was built in the early, or in the late 1930s. Uh, it's, it's, it's hardcore Dartmouth. Um, I am privileged to be on the advisory committee for it still. Um, and I'd like to use this as an example of grid-connected versus standalone power, because this place is, um, well, this, this place is kind of remote. You know, when you're halfway up Musalak, this is what it looks like. It's this little clearing down here. And um, in the, in, when it was built in the 1930s, uh, they, they took a power line out to it, which you can sort of see. Um, but then, uh, long about, oh gosh, when was it? Probably 1990, probably 10 years ago, roughly, or maybe 12 years ago. The, um, the power company figured this line was getting a little bit old. This power line was like 50 years old by that point. And the, um, and the, 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 the poles you know, were kind of rotting. And, and the wire was galvanized wire because they couldn't use copper during World War II. And uh, it wasn't very efficient. And they had a company policy. This, uh, New Hampshire Electric Co-op had a company policy to get rid of all this old wire by, you know, some date certain. And they looked at this and said, "Oh my God, you know, here's here's five Dartmouth students at the end of five miles of this line, you know, and um, whoa, this is going to be expensive." And, you know, ballpark, they were looking between, you know, a third and a half million dollars uh, to, you know, to to redo. So we had also, I said, what? and then, and then I, was, I was around, so I said, wow, what an opportunity. If I can get the co-op to give Dartmouth that half million dollars, you know, then we could turn Musalak into a real environmental showcase and do renewable energy and all sorts of great stuff. So there's this competition with, you know, from interests within Dartmouth. I mean, there's the, there's the environmental stewardship, the engineering, the teaching, um, sustainability. You know, and then there's the other side of Dartmouth, like keep the lights on, <laughs> keep the trains running, don't change things, we know how to fix it. Are you sure it's gonna work, you know? And, and in the end, it, it turned out, that, I think the college was ready to go on this, but it turned out that there's no cell coverage up here. And, and one thing the, out, the, the Dartmouth outdoors people kind of like, I think, is not having cell coverage up there, you know, they're away from it. And the college said, well, gosh, you know, we, we have a f one phone line. Actually, they have two. They have, they have two phone lines, one for their dial-up access and one for making phone calls. And we need it for safety reasons. We have to have communications there for safety reasons. So a meeting was arranged. And, and, and here's the utility thinking, gosh, a third to a half million dollars. Whoa, you know, this is ridiculous. So. The utility, the, the college and the utility invite the phone company to, to meet at the site. And, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, it's like, how are we going to share the cost of this? Or, you know, can you come up with a solution for the communications, the telephone lines? And, um, you know, big, big companies have policies, you know, that they have to follow all the time. And, and it turns out that... These weren't power poles. You know, you know, you know those, those brown things that are 40, 50 feet high? Some people call them telephone poles. 
Well, this guy from the phone company shows up you know, after three years of debating what we're going to do. And he says, oh, yeah, that's our line. We'll fix it. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Gone. So bottom line is that, uh, yeah, we came in. You know, we spent the third you know, the phone company for two lines. You know, rebuilt that pole line. And the college goes, <laughs> don't tell anybody. You know. Anyway, um, so standalone makes great sense. Um, but sometimes other considerations you know, come into it. And um, I don't know, I just like to tell that story because it, it kind of brings together you know, the, the, the energy usage. Oh, the other, other thing that college <laughs> discovered is they, they discovered compact fluorescent light bulbs. You know, like, oh, wow. Not only can we get them to rebuild the line, but we can cut our bill in half. <laughs> Even better. Um, so it, 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 it makes for strange stories. So anyway, um, random things happen. And, and sometimes, they're, sometimes they're amusing, like the Muslock story. Sometimes there are opportunities that just come out of the blue. Um, I'll be talking about the, the first one, uh, solar monitoring project. Uh, New York Power Authority wanted to understand how much sunlight there was in, in parts of their service territory to understand how well solar would do there. Uh, I'll be getting back to that a lot. Um, the other one, again, uh, is that the EPA uh, wanted to do a project to understand how much uh, air pollution would be mitigated, would be reduced by the use of, of solar panels. And their way of doing this, God bless them, was to say, well, we'd like to put up solar panels on rooftops all over the United States and do studies of how much energy is produced and then how much power plant use was reduced you know, and try to correlate the two and figure out what the, the CO2 and SOX and NOx and you know, uh, small particle pollution, you know, how much that would be reduced. And so you know, I, I talked about the PC earlier. We just, we just bought our first fax machine, my little company. We had this list of fax numbers and people and utilities all across the country. And um, you know, we just got busy and sent out faxes to all our friends saying, how many, how many kilowatts do you want to sign up for? And we got about 30 utilities from Hawaii to New England, to Arizona, to, oh gosh, Minnesota, you know, all across the country, saying, sure, you know, we'll do 10 kW. We'll find a rooftop. Sign us up. We'll, we'll be part of your proposal. So, so a fax machine, a contact list, an idea, boom. And, and we won that and went on to, to put PV, I think, on interconnected to the grid on uh, the first time ever in, I think, 25 states, United States. This is with a company with 10 people. That was a lot of fun. Um, another story, this is a little bit of a side, but I've got 15 minutes, and I think I can do it. Ooh, I'm only halfway through. <laughs> um, the uh, inverters for PV systems. There's a little company that spun off from my group at MIT Lincoln Lab called American Power Conversion. They made uh, inverters for the Gardner Project. They, um, they made really good inverters. Uh, over four or five years, they spent all their venture capital making about 200 of these really good inverters. And the money ran out you know, because there was no market. Uh, they were ahead of their time. So they brought in a guy uh, it was a turnaround specialist. And he, he took these three engineers and lined them up at a table and said, OK, what do you guys know how to do? And they say, oh, we know how to make DC into AC electricity. And we know how to turn it off immediately when the utility is having a problem. So it won't feed back onto the grid and do these evil things. And the guy said, huh, could you do it backwards? And uh, so this company is now a billion-dollar company called American Power Conversion. They didn't change the name. 
they make UPSs that you probably all have underneath your, your computers at your desk for when the power goes down. And it's the same thing, except that they just did it backwards. So, you know, to, to anyone who invents a technology, you know, keep your eye out for other applications of it. Um, it happens. Um, you know, th these guys, amazing, you know. Um, I'm still in solar, oh well. Um, so anyway, we, we in, in the 90s, we, we sort of uh, had a lot of fun doing first time projects. Uh, we got some opportunities that sort of came out of the blue at us, but it was starting to not be much fun. You know, it was like, oh, building codes. Oh, electric codes. Oh, you know, insurance requirements. Oh, you know, all that, all that sort of code book engineering stuff. And uh, it got less and less fun. And um, sort of the, you know, going from labs to real world, um, it just got to be less fun. Um, all these issues, you know, on and on and on, and then starting a real company. I had a guy actually that wanted to become my sales manager, and I didn't understand what a sales manager did for a company. It was, you know, like, oh, that would be like selling things as opposed to inventing things. That would be no fun. So we sort of moved on. Um, we, had, we had money from NREL uh, uh, to redesign things. Uh, new concepts for inverters, you know, a whole bunch of new ideas, uh, but you know, it, it got to be less fun. So, you know, when do you bail out? When it's no fun, uh, when your client base is being unbundled. They, they deregulated the power industry and all these utility R&D departments went away. All the money went to individual states with all the individual state politics. Um, you worry about, you know, this is, my company, you worry about you know, your own, investing your own resources. You, know, you think maybe that some investor will come in and help you change the world. And, uh, you know, and then the, the bottom line there is when do you regret doing it? And that's when the investor that helps you change the world changes his mind <laughs> and wants to sell you, which, um, which happened. And so that brings me to the, the last phase. Uh, sold the company. Uh, but basically picked up much of what uh, the company was doing uh, uh, to just do it by myself. And so now we come to the, the sponsorship, you know, not just government utilities, but corporations. And, and what's going on in the, in the solar world, you know, in the, in the uh, 2000s uh, to, to now? I mean, first Spain, you know, then China, now India, you know, are all sort of coming to the realization that, you know, this is going to be a good thing. Uh, there are others close behind, Australia, uh, Thailand is doing lots and lots of good stuff in solar. Um, uh, one thing I got to do uh, in, this, in this time period was a, a building integrated project in New York City. Uh, the arrow points down to Coney Island at the south end of the uh, New York City transit system. And uh, there we put up a, a couple hundred kilowatts in the roof. All, all you're seeing there is six, six rows of train tracks and a solar roof. It's one of the most expensive systems I've ever built. Uh, but architecture and art were the drivers. And it, it was actually, it's actually a beautiful thing and highly recommended to people in New York. When you, when, you, when you're in that space and looking up at the sun, you can actually see the sun through the panels. These are amorphous silicon panels, and so you can see right up in here, you can actually right through the panels. The, the light that's not converted to electricity comes straight through. It's a gorgeous space, it's, it's art. Um, just leave it at that. Um, the other thing, uh, another project was building or helping to build a, uh, a one megawatt system in, in the Philippines on the island of Mindanao, um, a, really a, a, a leader in the utility industry in, in, in the Philippines, uh, Ramona Baya, uh, wanted to do this. And uh, uh, I was brought in to help draw the specs up for this project in the, the town of Cagayan de Oro. And uh, what we did here was to try to emphasize as much as possible local labor, local materials. 
you know, let's not just bring stuff in from outside and plunk it down and leave. Let's, let's, let's have people know how to do this. And uh, I, I came up with an adage that, that everything should be uh, you know, one meter in size or 100 kilograms in, in, in uh, weight maximum. So it could be people oriented, not machine oriented. So we built this and it, um, it uh, still is a beautiful project. Um, you know, it's, it's small now compared to, you know, what's been built since, but this was brought online in, I think, 1980, 19, excuse me, 2004. Um, then uh, the World Bank uh, Global Environment Facility uh, brought us on board to help me, I guess, not us. It's a, it's a company of one at this point. Uh, to, to do lectures and travel and talking to utilities all over the world about, you know, figuring out how to integrate solar with their grids. Uh, one of them, India, um, actually built one of the first grid-tied systems in India uh, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, uh, and have been involved in, in helping Tata Power build another one uh, just recently brought online, and most are bare, uh, an even larger system. Uh, the first one, whoops, first one, uh-oh. Ooh. Something screwed up. No, you can't see the first two. You can see the last one. This one was just finished. Uh, it's in South India. It's uh, five megawatts of thin film um, in a town near Madurai. Uh, the other two were in Coimbatore and one in, uh, uh, in an area near Mumbai. Sorry about that. Pretty pictures. Um, Another unlikely thing, again, the World Bank asking me to go talk to people that expressed interest. Potato farms in the deserts in Egypt, who'd have guessed? Um, get over there and what do you find? You find uh, uh, pivot irrigation systems made in Nebraska by Valley, uh, right here. Uh, you find diesels made in <coughs> Illinois. And you find people in the, the basically watering the desert uh, it turns out that they, they told me um, that the curse of Egypt was uh, every time they drilled for oil, they found water. And the curse of Saudi Arabia is every time they looked for water, they found oil. <laughs> uh, and then what could be more fun, really, than sitting in, on a whiteboard, you know, drawing a pivot irrigation system, how big the PV system would be, trying to do all the math in a spreadsheet. Uh, and, and getting something started, which uh, they've now built this, but I haven't seen a picture of it yet. But they're, they're getting started, and they're going to be doing this um, both just outside the Nile Valley and in Upper Egypt as well. Um, so last, last thing that I've been up to um, lately is solar measurements. Uh, turns out that when people build large PV systems, they want to know how much energy they're going to get out of them, so they need to know how much sunlight there is. Um, I, put, I hesitate to put this up, but I mean, one, one number to remember, or two numbers to remember. Um, one is that above the atmosphere, the sunlight is about 1,367 watts per square meter. Um, the radius of the Earth, you can always look that up. This other one's a little bit more esoteric. Uh, and, and the other thing is that, that the Earth receives some incomprehensible large number of watts of, of radiant energy. And uh, I say that because so many times you hear presentations with huge numbers that just can't make any sense to you. So some advice is sort of take any of these numbers and sort of condense them down to something that you can understand. Um, other, other point is that the, um, in, in this picture, this, this is the radius of the Earth and the, the outer circle, which you can't even see, is the outside of the atmosphere. So when you think, when you look up at the sky, and you think, oh, wow, that's, that's big. You know, we live on a thin film of air. Um, it's, it's amazing. I mean, that, that's to scale. That's the Earth's atmosphere. You know, uh, half the Earth's atmosphere, you know, bet between here and Lyme is the thickness of the atmosphere. And you know that's sort of staggering. It's like a two-dimensional fluid flow. It's, it's amazing that we have to, you know, protect something so thin. But we we should. Um, so some quick notes on solar radiation. Um, you get direct beam from the sun, 
and you get diffuse light from the sky. And, and, and places where there's no atmosphere, you know, the, the sky is black, obviously. I mean, you, you don't need to know this, but I want you to think about it because solar panels, you know, respond to, some of them respond to just the direct sunlight, some of them respond to the direct and the, the skylight. And uh, so what's important when you're designing any PV system <laughs> is to know, you know, where the resource is coming from. You know, obviously the sun uh, rises in the northeast in the summertime, obviously in the northern hemisphere. You've got to get this right when you go to Australia. Um, and, and there's this path length through the atmosphere which gets larger and larger. It's called the, the air mass and, and how, much, how much air the, the, the light has to go through uh, depends on how much is left when it gets to the solar panel. So it's basically like one over the cosine of this what's called the zenith angle, how far down from straight up to, to where the sun is. So one over the cosine goes to infinity on a flat earth. But actually, when you, when, you, when you do a curved Earth like we live on, uh, it, o it only goes to about 37. You know, because you know, once you get down to the horizon, you know, you're still not looking horizontally through the atmosphere. But in, in any event, the, the, the air mass uh, curtails the amount of light that gets through. And then, of course, over the, whoops. Ooh, that went quicker. Over the course of the day, like at noontime, you know, the, the sun will be a lot higher, and, and you'll have much more direct light coming through. Uh, and you can conceive of projects that would have different types of tracking, um, uh, different ways of, of um, capturing this light. So uh, to take a quick look at Hanover for the past two years, uh, this, this is a measuring device that's on top of Murdo, uh, two years worth of data from it. And, and generally uh, we get, um, you know, at most, uh, in the summer, this direct sunlight, this, whoa, what did I do? Help. Uh, okay, we're still good. You get direct sunlight, you know, it can be up as, mount, as much as 11 kilowatt hours per meter squared if you're following the sun from sunrise to sunset. Um, the actual total on a fixed surface is much less, you know, as shown in the, the lower numbers here. Um, this is the kind of thing that you need to do when you're looking at annual yields and annual production for solar panels. And you're looking at just one month, you can see you know, significant variability from day to day. I mean, you get good days and bad days, which you know, rainy days, clear days. When you, when you look at um, just a couple days, you, you, you start looking at the individual distribution over the daytime. And one thing that comes to mind here is that you, know, you don't get any power at night. Um, from the annual cycle to a utility, you don't get any power uh, to speak of in the winter, you get much more in the summer. Uh, and it's, it's kind of, you can see here, this is hourly data. It's kind of spiky, you know, you get a clear day, a cloudy day and then a clear day. Clear days are nice, mathematical, look, look pristine. Uh, this cloudy day is kind of rough. If you really look at this kind of a cloudy day, this is what it looks like. This is every minute as opposed to every hour. And you can see something about why utilities might be concerned about these generators that are doing this kind of stuff, uh, cycling high and low all the time. So um, these are real issues, you know, they're, they're being studied. Um, if you look at the, the daily total generation from the Dartmouth PV system uh, on the vertical scale, kilowatt hours produced, and on the horizontal scale, uh, the daily sunlight on the system. The difference is, you know, either A, the system's not working, uh, B, the, uh, uh, the panels are covered with snow, uh, or, you know, in the case of the present, the panels have been taken off because they're re-roofing the building. Uh, but you do typically see, you know, a maximum that you'd likely get um, as a function of daily sunlight. Uh, the variation is a function of the air temperature uh, and then you, you have, you know, strange but true events that, that, that reduce the amount. So you don't always get everything, but, you know, looking at this and, and wondering why is, you know, is a good, good thing to do for engineering. Um, jumping now to large scale, uh, sort of other things I'm working on around the world. This is a uh, very large power plant in southern Spain near 
Granada. Um, it is a not a photovoltaic, but a concentrating solar thermal system. And um, it uses mirrors to focus sunlight on uh, a receiver. And then this receiver uh, carries uh, high temperature oil to make steam to run a conventional turbine. Um, they're being given a very hard run now by people using photovoltaics. Because one thing about these is they need conventional steam equipment. They need cooling. They need cooling towers, uh, condensing. Uh, and water is very often scarce in, in places where these make sense. Um, one place like that that um, I, I've been doing some work is in the Atacama Desert in Chile. It's probably the, one of the sunniest places in the world. Um, what you have there is uh, a bunch of mining companies that need electricity. And so they all put their power plants right on the ocean where they can bring ships with coal and use ocean water for cooling in the, in the uh, generators. Uh, and then what they do is they, they run power lines out into the desert. And, and each individual mining company has its individual power plant and its individual lines. It's, it's really weird. It's kind of a free for all. Um, uh, the cost effectiveness of that, however, uh, you know, I, I've been showing you pictures of the price of, of, um, of oil over the, over the long term. This is what's happened to the price of coal. And so suddenly you have, uh, just in the last you know, three or four years, five years, the price of coal has gone up from its typical $40 a ton, you know, it's almost doubling. And, and so this is making these uh, mining companies interested. Uh, and if you remember those that slides of Hanover, where the sunlight, you know, seldom got more than, you know, 1,000 watts per square meter, you know, here is four days in a row, typical Atacama weather. Uh, they get a quarter of an inch of rain a year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the most uh, clear places on Earth for, uh, for, for putting solar. But uh, unfortunately, the only customers up there are the mining companies. Um, you know, there's some talk about building a big transmission line from northern Chile down to Santiago, uh, maybe from Chile over into uh, Brazil. But, it, you know, the, the question is getting the power to some place it can be used. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with just a, just a bunch of slides of <coughs> instruments that, you know, I've started making about three or four years ago, or re restarted making. I made some in the 1990s. When I sold my company, uh, you know, this technology went uh, to the new owners and they didn't use it. And I bought it back from them about I don't know, four or five years ago. And um, it's, it's been consuming me. Um, here's a, a typical installation. Uh, it's a, a measuring sensor head. Actually, there's one of these uh, on Murdo. Uh, it's a measuring sensor head that measures sunlight. A, um, usually wind speed and direction powered by a solar panel, uh, a data logger that does all the, the, the number measurements, and uh, an antenna connected to a cell phone to, to send the data back to the internet so I can access these things you know, all over the world. So here's one in the San Luis Valley of, of Colorado near Alamosa. It's uh, about 3,000 meter elevation. It's way up there, not much, not much atmosphere to go through. Good thing. Sponsored by the uh, Colorado Energy Office trying to attract people to this area to, um, to build solar farms. Uh, here's one in Tunisia, uh, same thing, solar prospecting. It's a, a British company uh, seeking to put large scale solar in the North African desert. Uh, in Utah, have the same sort of thing. This is the state of Utah Energy Office uh, wanting to figure out how much their land is worth. It's kind of like, um, you know, if they're going to drill for oil here, how much do we charge them to, to do it? Well, if you're going to uh, build solar here, how much do we charge you for the land? Uh, the Bureau of Land Management's also started doing this in Colorado with us. Um, Bright Source is an Israeli company that's one of the leaders in concentrating solar thermal. Uh, they use our systems for uh, system control. Uh, they're building a huge plant about 30, 40 miles south of Las Vegas, just over the line in California. Um, here's one in northern New Mexico, northwestern New Mexico. Uh, it's a, it's a, going to be a CSP plant. 
concentrating solar, excuse me, concentrating solar thermal, and they're going to use the output thermal to augment the, uh, the heat going into boilers at a coal-fired plant. It's owned by a Colorado utility. Uh, this is Victoria State, uh, Australia, a um, company that wanted to build a 140 megawatt uh, PV power plant for the Australian uh, solar power initiatives. Unfortunately, they lost. Um, northeastern New Mexico, this is a this was just installed last week and got it running. Uh, this, this is a uh, concentrating photovoltaic plant um, on a brownfield owned by a, uh, you know, I think it used to be a tank farm for a petroleum company. Uh, they're, they're one of the things that people, these people, instead of remediating this land and, and bringing it back to pristine nature, uh, some deals have been struck where you can install solar on them instead. Um, and Ooh, almost finished on time. Um, last slide. Th this is kind of where this business has taken me uh, in the last, what, four years, uh, doing these types of installations and working with utilities and, and uh, developers of large-scale solar. So I hope that's close to what was advertised. I don't know. Thank you, Edward. You're welcome. Uh, What they're talking about is solar cells are kind of like batteries in a flashlight. Um, each one increases the voltage a little bit, but they all have to pass the same electric current through them. So if you take out one cell, if you shade one cell, it's like having a flashlight with five batteries and taking one out of them. And so the, he's right. Um, but so you should keep the leaves off your solar panels. That's a good thing. Um, you should decide whether you like your trees or your solar panels better. That, that I, I think I spoke about earlier. Um, it depends on where your electricity comes from, you know, whether it comes from a coal plant or a gas-fired plant, as to what the environmental trade-offs are. And I, I can't help you with that, I'm afraid. Um, but that's, that's the answer. Sure. Um, typically, I mean, the, the, the standard number for, um, you know, like a reference number for solar radiation is 1,000 watts per square meter. Again, there's like 1,367 above the atmosphere, so, you know, 30% of it's lost. Uh, of that 1,000 watts, uh, usually, you know, between 100 and 150 watts will come out as electricity. Uh, between 850 and 900 then uh, end up basically just heating up the solar panel and uh, that heat gets dis dispersed into the, uh, into the air. And in terms of, in terms of um, efficiency, yes, you know, there have been incremental changes uh, going from you know, 12 to 15 to maybe 16 or 17 percent conversion, which would translate to 120 watts you know, per square meter to 170, say. But um, the, 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 the better question is how much does it cost? Because some of the lower cost technologies uh, are less efficient, but you know, on, a, on a per dollar basis, they, they would be a better investment. So, you know, if you can buy a, if, if you have a 10% or say a 15% panel, you know, for $4 would be the same as a 7.5% uh, panel for $2. And that kind of stuff happens. Yeah. How efficient is, by comparison, the direct thermal conversion of the sun, either to mirrors or other processes? 
That's what happens when you're a PV guy. Um, well, the, the, the standard thermal cycle plants, you know, converting thermal energy to um, uh, electricity, you know, you're talking 35% rough number. Uh, the efficiency of the collectors and moving sunlight, you know, into that thermal storage, I'm not sure, but I, th I think the numbers are, uh, if I had to guess, I'd say 70%. So three, 70 times 30, maybe 20% for these. But these concentrators have to work on direct sunlight only. It's another important thing. They have to track the sun. I just learned about a word about the future of PV, yeah. especially in the U.S. A word about the future of PV in the U.S. It's all in politics. Um, I'd say politics is the answer because uh, the cost of PV uh, from large-scale plants is now maybe achieving parity with the, the, you know, the, some of the higher cost conventional generation, but there's still incentives in place uh, that, that are used to, to bring the, the prices down. One of the uh, MEM students I spoke with this morning, uh, if you're here somewhere, but uh, you'll know if I say this, uh, asked me something about the, 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 the industry and what's happened, and I, I told him that um, the early times in the industry were, were environmentalists and idealists and, and hippies and, and uh, do-gooders, you know, and scientists and, and not business people. And, and more recently, with the advent of subsidies, you know, in California, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, you know, some places, Spain in particular, has, has a lot of. Um, he, he said, "Oh, that's the gold rush," you know. So there's the environmental motivation, and then there's the the gold rush, and these were the salespeople come in, and and you're trying to sell the stuff. And, which is needed more, you know, the scientist engineers reducing the costs, coming up with clever designs, or, you know, marketing people, or uh, politicians, you know, in putting in favorable policies. So I think the future, you know, the, the evolution of the technology is, is incremental. The, the, the potential for uh, changes in policy are, are, you know, sort of binary. You know, I mean, if you look at uh, the Solyndra uh, case, which has been in the press recently, you know, the DOE is getting a, a bad rap for uh, supporting a, um, you know, a startup company that, that went bankrupt. You know, bad press like that is going to hurt the case for solar. And it's going to, you know, go beyond, you know, it's going to hurt the industry, not the uh, individual company so much. So, no, we're, we're, we're close to parity, but not, not there yet. Yeah. Is there any possibility of uh, a uh, combined uh, solar installation where the solar panel would do both photovoltaic and have the solar hot water running through it? Um, there's a possibility, but there's a challenge there. Um, I actually spent quite a bit of uh, your taxpayers' money looking into this 25 years ago. Uh, to, to no result, I'm afraid. The, 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 the problem is that with, with anything solar thermal, uh, you need to insulate the receiver in order to take the heat off at any decent elevated temperature. So you put an, an extra glass layer or something like that above the absorbing surface. That cuts down, the one layer of glass cuts about 10% of the light out. Um, so that's, that's one thing. You, you, you try to do both with the same thing. Uh, you get less sunlight onto the, the PV. The, the other thing is that, that PV cells um, operate uh, more efficiently when they're colder. Uh, actually, it's about a half a percent loss for every degree C increase in temperature. And so if you're trying to do both things at once, you know, you're, you're at odds. And so we looked at that and sort of said, nah, not going to work. Well, you know, unless someone has a better idea. Uh, I'd like you to speak with Edward, uh, if you wish. It was, uh, You're very welcome. <laughs>